If you're telling history, there has to be something to it that relates to today. So you're not just regurgitating an old story. You're telling and talking about something that is relevant to today. And I think that this story uh, is extremely relevant today. This is a story, as I've told several people here this evening, that has the breadth and depth of a Russian novel. It has dozens of characters and it goes on for decades and decades. We've heard the date so many times now. The day was Wednesday. It was June 2, 1976. And again, one of those days among all of them that will live in infamy. Don Bowles is a 47-year-old investigative reporter for the Arizona Republic. He's been working on a series about the Mafia. Today, as he attempted to start his car, a bomb went off. Tonight, Bowles is in critical condition, fighting for his life. It didn't and doesn't have the historic horror of Pearl Harbor. It uh, certainly doesn't have the celebrity status of O.J. Simpson's drive up the 405 freeway. But what it did do was alert America to the dangers and risks that reporters go through every day. The car was damaged and Bowles lost a leg. Hospital attendants who picked up Bowles said he told them he was working on a story concerning the Mafia. Apparently, Bowles was working on a story involving several dog tracks in Arizona. It transformed the face of journalism in America. Um, but above all, it changed the status of Phoenix that went from relatively insignificant cow town to very important big city with all of the problems that attend that status. June 2nd, he had gone to a hotel to meet an informant, a meeting that didn't take place. It was a setup. And when Bowles returned to his car, a remote control bomb exploded under the driver's seat. I heard a loud boom, and it literally shook the building. A few seconds later, one of the carpenters or electricians yelled, explosion. Well, that got me curious, so I got down off the ladder, took off my tool pouch, went outside through the west emergency door. I looked to my right at the Clarendon Hotel parking lot and saw a light colored haze. That's when I heard a man scream, almost like someone on fire, a long, drawn-out wail. We sat down for, uh, for lunch right around, right around 11.30, and not one of us got a, a bite uh, before that explosion went off, and it literally shook our fire station. Every window in it, uh, I'm surprised that the glass didn't shatter. It, it was such a loud and powerful explosion. We were already on our trucks, uh, in our turnout gears, uh, when the call came in, and it um, came in as an explosion at the hotel. Um, something to do with the car. When I entered the northern entrance to the parking lot, I saw a white four-door Datsun B710 backed out of a parking space. The driver's door was open and a man was laying outside face down on the ground. He raised his head up and yelled, help me, help me. The man's body lay at about a 45 degree angle to the car. His limbs were intact but his legs were severely damaged. A pool of blood extended from his waist to the knee of the right leg. From four inches below the groin to below the calf, the leg looked like a pile of hamburger with shreds of cloth in it. Seeing this, I knew I had to stop the bleeding. So I took off my belt and straddled his body. I lifted his right leg at the hip and fed the belt through it at the groin lacing it through the buckle, cinching it tight, and tied it off. I remember a, a woman kind of kneeling over him. Uh, we went right into action on it. Um, I went down and started working on his legs. Uh, and as Lonnie said, there, there wasn't a lot left of, of his legs. 
Um, other guys were working on his upper body. The, um, a lot of trauma. There was a, a lot of trauma to him. We put trauma packs on him, and it wasn't too long after we got there. The uh, ambulance got there, and we loaded him as quick as possible. When the ambulance left 10 to 20 minutes later, things seemed to slow down. A fireman saw the blood on my hands and came over to check it out. I told him what I'd done, and he responded, your quick action probably saved his life. Apparently it did. I had stopped the bleeding, and he lived for 11 more days. The Arizona Republic had assigned Bulls to the state legislative beat after his research on organized crime had made him the most celebrated investigative reporter in the state. It had also made him a target. So you've heard a lot of what happened at the time of the bombing and what half happened afterwards. Let me give you a little bit of what happened right before. Around 11 o'clock a.m., Don Bowles sits at his desk at the state capitol. He left two notes. One was on his desk, and it simply read, John Adamson, lobby at 11.15, Clarendon House, 4th and Clarendon. The second note was left for Don's supervisor, Bernie Wynn. And it simply said, Bernie, I've gone to meet that guy with the info on Steiger at the Clarendon House, then to Sigma Delta Chi, back around 1.30 p.m., Bowles. Well, soon Bowles headed out in his car and came over to the, then the Clarendon House. He pulled up in the parking lot right behind us on the south side of the building. He walked around to the front lobby, the doors that you all came through. He went inside the front lobby and he was waiting for a while and finally a call came in. Remember, no cell phones at that time. Call came in to the front desk. The clerk gave him the phone. And it was John Adamson saying, sorry, I won't be able to make it today. The desk clerk told us that he was pretty upset about that, just kind of disturbed a little bit, but somehow his mind became very calm as he started walking back through an aisle that went back through the, uh, the Clarendon house. And he became calm because he came across a woman and her young daughter who was at the swimming pool, the swimming pool right below us here. And he's just taken by that young girl because it seemed to be the same age as his daughter. And he started talking to that woman. And he told her how it was his anniversary on June 2nd, anniversary today. And he was going to be taking his wife, Rosalie, tonight to go see all the president's men. For years, Don Bowles had worked as an investigative reporter for the Arizona Republic. He had won awards for his stories on government corruption, mafia infiltration of racetracks, of land fraud involving organized crime. The people here say that is why he was killed. He may have known too much. Bowles had given up investigative reporting eight months ago, saying the work was too frustrating. There had been threats on his life. But a telephone call lured him here to the Hotel Clarendon June 2nd. An informant had promised to meet him here with information he claimed linked Senator Barry Goldwater and Congressman Sam Steiger to an Arizona land fraud scheme. But the man never arrived, and when Bowles started to drive out of the hotel parking lot, his car exploded. There was this pandemonium in the newsroom, and Bob Early, who was our city editor, he was always our rock. He was always just like a piece of granite. He, we trusted him and relied on him, and all, I had never seen him flustered in the entire time I'd known him. Bob Early was going berserk, and he was screaming, where is Sitter, where is Sitter? And he was screaming that because he had just gotten a phone call that said that a reporter had been blown up at the Clarendon Hotel in downtown Phoenix. And in Bob's mind, the only reporter we had at the Arizona Republic that anybody would have gone after would have been Al Sitter. Al Sitter comes sauntering into the newsroom like there's nothing going on, and, all, and that made it even more incredible because then it wasn't Al. Al was alive. Al was right here with us. So who the hell had been blown up? And nobody knew. And, and then finally someone called and said, there is a Capitol press sticker on the car. And Early said, oh my God, it's gotta be Don. What the hell is Don working on? 
I mean, he immediately knew that there had been some story that Don had been covering. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching all of this and I'm thinking, this can't be true. Jana has eloquently described the reactions of the newsroom. It went a little deeper than that. I can remember Bob Early standing up and just saying, God almighty, God almighty, God damn it. My expression of rage, I was holding a Parker pen in my hand and I just hurled it against the wall and it shattered in pieces. But immediately, the newsroom kind of settled and all these professional reporters kind of came back into their element, which was reporting the news. It's sharpened our teeth, that's what it's done. And this is probably the uh, worst mistake that these people made in that uh, they thought they could silence one man, and they have silenced one man, but they can't silence the entire news media. And uh, all they've achieved is to bring more heat upon themselves. Don Bowles will be difficult to replace in this newsroom, but if his death was meant to scare off other reporters, it has backfired. And now a lot of his colleagues say they are determined to pick up where he left off. A reporter's job is to forget emotions, because they will add a bias to his questioning and thinking and translation, which will eventually steer a story away from its true direction. So despite the fact of my friendship with Don, uh, which was intense, I was best man at his wedding to Rosalie, and he borrowed one of my ties for the occasion, never gave it back. Um, but despite that, like any reporter, you switch off, because there's a job to be done. His newspaper has made a front page promise not to forget Don Bowles. Under the story telling of his death, an editorial is bannered in red. It says, that death shall not go unavenged. It concludes, we could not rest if Don Bowles had died utterly in vain. Rick Davis, NBC News, Phoenix. I was told by my supervisors to go contact Don Bowles and administer him a dying declaration. Now for the ones that don't know what that is, a dying declaration is an exception to the hearsay rule. The exception to that hearsay rule is that the person has to be told he's going to die, he has to believe he's going to die, and he has to die. I told my supervisors that I would not do that, that I would go interview him, but I would not give him a dying declaration. He was lucid, he was rational, he was bandaged, both his legs and his arm, and the other arm was fairly well mangled. He had a trach. I did not have any way to talk to him where he could respond. So it was mostly I asked a question and Bowles would nod or raise a finger on his hand as to what I was asking. The main thing I was asking is who was John Adams? Critically injured, Bowles gasped four words to bystanders. Mafia, Emprise, the name of a New York sports concessionaire which once owned a piece of six dog racing tracks here, and John Adamson, the man Bowles later identified from a hospital bed as his informant. When Bowles died Sunday afternoon, after the amputation of both legs and one arm, Adamson was charged with his murder. Phoenix police know Adamson well. He's a man with a criminal record, and police say he has underworld associates. He's a gambler and breeder of racing dogs, friendly with Ned Warren, an Arizona real estate magnate who has been under investigation here for land fraud. Both M. Prize and Ned Warren have been under close scrutiny by grand juries. It was M. Prize money which bailed out an Arizona firm controlling six dog racing tracks. And in 1972, M. Prize was convicted of conspiring to hide ties to underworld gambling interests in Nevada. Warren's name has been linked with organized crime for years. Edward Lazar, president of several of Warren's real estate companies, was gunned down last year, one day before he was to testify to a grand jury investigating his boss. 
And it was at Warren's request, say some sources, that Senator Barry Goldwater and Congressman Sam Steiger wrote letters back in 1971 endorsing the sale of nearly worthless Arizona land to U.S. servicemen. The scheme was later found to be illegal. Both Arizona Republicans say they had no idea the land deal wasn't legitimate. Police say there will be more arrests in the Bowles murder case and more grand jury investigations into organized crime in Arizona. Sharon Lovejoy, CBS News, Phoenix. You know, on that day, June 2nd, you heard about how it affected the local media. Jan and Paul explained it brilliantly as to how it affected them personally. But it also had an effect on that day of the national media around the country and around the world. Don had become a member of a group called the Investigative Reporters and Editors, IRE. It was just two years old, and he had just returned, actually, from one of their, I think it was a second anniversary convention that they had. And the journalism wanted to do something, something we had to do. And they formed a team. It had never been done before in the history of journalism. They put together 40 reporters most from outside the state, from print, from radio, from TV, that came to Arizona and worked with Arizona Republic reporters, some who are here tonight, and worked on, on coming to Arizona to carry on Don's work. They weren't here to go ahead and solve the murder. They were here to make sure that his stories did not die. When a Phoenix newsman, Don Bowles, was murdered last summer while investigating a land fraud scandal, reporters from across the country went to that state to conduct their own investigation of scandals in Arizona. They're now telling their story, and Sharon Lovejoy has details. Among the many findings to be revealed by the investigative team during the next several weeks are white-collar swindlers bribing their way to freedom. In nationwide radio broadcasts and in more than 20 newspapers across the country, the Arizona story began to unfold this morning. A story of crime in that state, put together by a team of 39 journalists from 26 different news organizations. The team promised to carry on the work of Don Bowles, leaving his murder for the police to solve. The reporters were led by an editor from Long Island's Newsday, Robert Green, who described some of the team's findings to CBS News reporter Sam Chu Lin. We have been able to demonstrate uh, that Arizona is facing a massive problem with organized crime. We have been able to document who those people are and what they are doing. Uh, that. Uh, the state is not geared as it stands to handle this problem alone. I announced the races at Turf Paradise from uh, 72 through 78, the year after Don was killed. Kemper Marley's name was being thrown about quite a bit. Uh, you've got to understand, I announced horse races. Kemper Marley's horses crossed that finish line first an incredible number of times. He was a past member of the Racing Commission, lost his post in large part due to articles written by Don. I never met Kemper Marley, but as I'm reading about him and hearing about him, I simply walk from my announcing booth into the press box, and this was my question. Can anybody tell me what's Kemper Marley's story? The man who represented the Daily Racing Forum, who had been in that press box since they built Turf Paradise in 1954. The elder statesman of the group got up from his chair, came over, motioned for me to go back into my announcer's booth. He closed the door and he sat in my chair while I stood and he said, you've got a big mouth and it gets you in trouble. Take my advice. Don't ever ask that question again. He got up. He walked out of my booth. He closed the door behind him. And I feel like leaving that story out on this day would be an injustice. The investigation has went for 40 years. It's still ongoing if any worthy evidence comes in. I believe we got the right guys. Did we get them all? 
I don't know. But I did testify in open court that Kemper Marley was a suspect and in my opinion is still a suspect. Now if anyone else has any more information, I would be l glad to hear it and we'll pass it on to the investigating agencies to pursue this case. Many theories have been piled upon supposition, upon theory, and uh, none of them have really worked. I will say here, unequivocally, that this murder was never solved. Stop with the conspiracy theories, please. It hasn't worked for the Kennedy assassination. It didn't work for the disappearance of Amelia Earhart, who probably just ran out of gas. And uh, so stop fishing in the deep waters. Stop looking for these you know, humongous connections with the organized crime or the crime bosses of Phoenix, Arizona. Go back to the shallows. Paddle around there because that's where you're going to find the answer. The evidence is still out there. It's up to these, today's journalists, to go find it. <laughs>